Good evening, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. Thank you so much for joining us for Bible study on tonight. We just thank and praise God for allowing us another opportunity just to come to the house of worship. Our scripture tonight will come from Psalm 145, verses 1, 2, and 3. Psalm 145, verses 1, 2, and 3 from the New King James Version. And it reads, I will extol you, O my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Verse number three again says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Our song for today is, How Great is Our God. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Oh, see how great, how great. heavens in Jesus name we thank you God we glorify you once again for just being God we realize that you are the great God 
You are God all by yourself. Lord, we thank you for tonight, for another chance, another privilege, another opportunity to dig into your word. Lord, we pray, Father God, that you forgive us for all sin, that no sin will keep us from your word. Bless us tonight as we hear your word, that your word will fall on good soil, that your word will go forth, and that your word, Father God, will make us better. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. It's our God. We serve the great and the awesome God, don't we? Amen. 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 We serve the great and the awesome and the amazing God. There is none like him. Thank you, Sister Sophia. Thank you, Sister Davis, for reminding us that we serve the awesome God. We're in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. We're dealing with verses 1 through 20, and we are not even a fourth of the way there yet. Amen? Tonight, we're dealing with verses 1 through 7, which was your homework, right? That was your homework. Verses 1 through 7 was your homework. Can someone remind us what our homework was for, for last, last week, which would, should be here this week? Anybody? If you looked at it just one while, you ought to know what it is. Amen? What was our homework assignment last, from last week? We had to ask, answer the questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Answer those questions. Those are, those are one-word questions. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? If, if you have one-word questions. When I when I when I when I um, when I haven't seen a person in a long time, as you say, I haven't seen you in a minute, and I haven't seen them at church, I would just type these these words in: who, what, when, where, why, and how. And I would text that. And that's all I would say. Well, what am I asking? There's a question mark behind it. What would I? What am I asking? Number one. Who are you? Number two, what are you doing? Number three, when will I see you again? Number four, where have you been and why haven't I seen you? And how will you make this happen? With Joe, just those words, that's, those are the questions I'm asking. If I hadn't seen a member in a while, I just text those questions and it generates conversation. Well, we're dealing with two words as we were last week. What were those two, two key words that we're dealing with? Homiletics, that's one of them. And hermeneutics. And hermeneutics, amen. So we distinguished last week the difference between hermeneutics, which first of all we deal with hermeneutics. It's spelled H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-T-I-C-S. Again, hermeneutics, H-E-R-M-E-N. E-U-T-I-C-S. Hermeneutics. Sister Brown, what's hermeneutics? <laughs> well, that's the right answer. <laughs> that's, that's a truthful answer there. Hermeneutics. Who wants to tell me what hermeneutics is? What is hermeneutics? Presentation. Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. Yes. Preparation. 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 Hermeneutics. When we look at a passage of scripture or a verse of scripture, we want to know what it is saying. And when we deal with hermeneutics, we are digging. The example I gave last week was as a person digs for gold. You know there are nuggets there. You know there's something good there. You want to dig for what's there. And if we do not do the proper hermeneutical studies, then guess what? We line on God. We're, if we don't say what the author is saying, then we're not telling the truth. And God is the, the author, and God has employed over 40 writers, but God is the author, and we're lying on the author. We're lying on God. To prove my point, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. Our passage for tonight is... Um, 
Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. We want to take a quick look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. Anybody has a King James Bible? Anybody reading from King James tonight? Yes. Okay. We used, everybody there, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 15. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Will you stand and read that for us? Verse number 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Okay. Those of us who, re who remain, those of us who are alive and remain, shall not prevent. Key word here is prevent shall not prevent those who are asleep. The background here is that the Apostle Paul is telling Christians that we should not sorrow as some people who have no hope. When we have loved ones who died in Christ Jesus, don't be sorrowful and weep as if you have no hope. Didn't say don't weep. It didn't say don't be sorrowful. But he did say don't weep and be sorrow as those who have no hope. In other words, when we weep, when we moan, we ought to weep, we ought to moan, but you ought not weep and moan as if there is no hope. Then he goes on to say, those who have died in Christ, believing the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, those who have died in Christ, they will, they will rise first. Verse 15 declares that those of us who remain will not prevent those who are asleep. The word prevent in our daily English language means what? What does prevent mean? Prevent. Stop. Prevent. Prevent. To stop. Prevent. What does that mean? To hold back. Prevent means to hinder. Right? This is the 20th and the 21st century. This is what the word means. Prevent. But when we read it, do we even have the power to prevent folk from going to heaven? Yes? I know people can make you so mad that they you think that they, they're going to make you miss it. But We don't have the power, right? So it doesn't even make sense. So this word prevent, who has another version of the Bible? Who has New American Standard? Which one do you have? Okay, let's read NIV. First Thessalonians. Yes. Will you stand for us? First Thessalonians chapter... Chapter 4, verse 15. Yeah, 4, 15, New International Version. Uh, according to the Lord's own will, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. So what word is missing in that version compared to the King James Version? Prevent. The word prevent is missing, yeah, right? Precede. Precede. Precede instead of prevent. But you do know that God doesn't, doesn't lie, right? We know that God's word does not contradict itself, right? So why is it prevent over here and proceed over here? Different translations. Different translations, but why is this translation telling us that we will not proceed? Because that's what the word prevent means in the Greek from the other, from the King James Version. Right, so the word in the King James is prevent. The word in the original Greek, when the author wrote it, when he wrote it, he was saying should not proceed. The word prevent at that time meant should not proceed. When I grew up, and I use this analogy all the time, Coke was what? Something you drink. Now what does Coke mean? When you're on the street and you say you got some Coke. Drugs. Drugs. When I grew up, ice was something you pour your drink over. What is ice now? Drug. When I grew up, say again. Oh, that's what it means too? Well, I don't have much of that, so I don't know. <laughs> so, so ice is jewelry. When I grew up, dough meant money, as well as dough meant something that you need or something that you eat. What does dough mean now? It can mean something that you eat, something that you, something that you, you uh, have in your pocket. Money, right? So dough means money. 
Mula. What is that? Money. What language is that? Street. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, as time moves on, words mean different things in different generations. It means different things in different time periods. And if we're going to use biblical hermeneutics well, we have to do our word study and our research. How many of you have a, a phone or a tablet that has the, um, the Strong's concordance on it that you can pull up at any time? No? No? Okay, Brother Miles, you have an Android, right? Tell us the name of that Strong's concordance. It's, um, and then, Sister Davis, tell us the name of the strong concordance that you're using for the iPad or iPhone. Anybody can help me? I use Blue Letter Bible. Blue Letter Bible. Why do you use Blue Letter Bible? Because it has a concordance attached to it. Sister, Sister Whitlock, you were about to say something. The sword. The sword. The, the sword Bible. Everybody need one on their phone, okay? Is it life sword? My sword. My sword. My Sword Bible. Download it on your phone. Get the free version. They're going to try to sell you some stuff. Get the free version. My Sword Bible. At one time on the iPhone, it was called something else, but I think on both platforms, it's called My Sword Bible. So what you do is you go on there, you open it up, you push the word, the word prevent in this case. You push the word prevent, and it'll tell you what it means. Because it's a concordance. You cannot use today's Google to do your Bible study. As when I was in school in the 80s and the 90s, you could not use Merriam Webster or Noah Webster's dictionary to do your Bible study. You need to know what the word means. And in this case, we found out already that the word prevent means what? Proceed, And so it makes sense when we say those who are still living will not proceed those who are dead or those who are asleep. What does the word sleep mean? Dead, dead right? So we have to understand when, when the Bible was written, it wasn't written in the same language in the same time frame. Okay? And so we want to make sure that we understand the language, so we won't lie on God. People shout off lies. People get excited off lies. But you can tell that's a group of people who have not done their word study. So hermeneutics, hermeneutics is, is the, the basic platform that we use to make sure we understand what the word is saying. The first process of hermeneutics is called observation. Observation. It means to observe, right? To look at, to examine, to read. So the first word was hermeneutics. What's the second word? Homiletics. If hermeneutics is the preparation, then what is homiletics? The presentation. Hermeneutics is the preparation. Homiletics is the presentation. And any person, and the example that I always give is any teacher that stands before a group of people and he or she has not done his or her hermeneutical biblical studies, then he's not going to present the word of God properly. Last week I asked Brother Whitlock, does he do his Saturday night special? What's the Saturday night special? One of you gangsters said, duh. <laughs> We're not talking about that. <laughs> What's the sound of nice special, Brother, brother Galvan? Uh, you mean preparing uh, prepare the lesson you're going to deliver for Sunday school? Right. So, it, it, Saturday night special means you haven't looked at the Sunday school lesson all week long. You get to Saturday and you prepare. And you, you're doing your Saturday night special. You are, you are into it. You're making sure that you get it done before in the morning. But the students can always tell when you have a Saturday night special message. How can they tell? How can they tell? 
You're not ready. You're not. See, because the students have studied the word. Right, Brother Miles? Your students have always, Brother Whitlock, your students always come prepared. Sister Galvan, your students are always prepared, right? So when they walk in the room, they can tell when you haven't studied. So hermeneutics is the, prefer, prepar, the preparation of presenting. Homiletics is the presentation itself. So, the first thing we look at is observation. When we're talking about hermeneutics, we haven't even talked about um, homiletics yet because homiletics is, is after you've done your study, you get up and you present and different styles for different people. And so, one of the things we mentioned last week, the first step is to read the passage in the sur surrounding passages to read it. We even talked about the second step being to reread what you just read at least 40 to 50 times. Preferably 50 times. I mean, Brother Galvan, before he stand up on Sunday morning or sit down on Sunday morning, he has taken that Sunday school lesson and before he did any study, before he did any word study, he has read that lesson 50 times over and over and over again all during the week. Because he's preparing. They even do that at, at, at Sister Brown's church. 50 times. That's why, that's why on Sunday, if, if I choose to use a note or two, I'm not bothered when the paper falls on the floor. I'm not bothered. Why am I not bothered? Because I know the story. And that's the third step. You got to make sure that you know the unity of the passages. You know the structure. You know the theme. You know the progress. You know the interaction. You have to know that story. You have to study the story. You have to study it over and over again. You are so prepared. If your paper get blown away, you can still present. In the 80s and the 90s, we used to do street preaching. Anybody ever seen people do street preaching? And it wasn't just standing with a microphone fall hollering at people, okay? Street preaching was so well coordinated, so organized. We had five different preachers on five, four to five preachers on four to five different corners, and we were preaching. One educated guy, and I stress educated, he went out there on the street, and he had his notebook with him. And the wind was blowing. And he was slipping from one page to the other. He only had 15 minutes to preach. He's slipping from one page to the other, and he's making sure that he's crossed every T, dot, every I. And the wind blew his paper away and shirt shirt completely down. Because he didn't know the story. What a moment. <laughs> We're depending on you. Your students are depending on you to unpack the text. They're depending on you, not just for homiletics, but for hermeneutics. They're depending on you. They are depending on you. Someone is asking me, how can you drive or ride all night from Mississippi, get here at 2 o'clock in the morning, Get two, three hours of sleep. Get up and preach. How can you do that? Did you, Pastor Davis, do a Saturday night special? Not at all. You have to know it. You have to have it in your heart. Have it in your head. You have to know it. So your homework assignment is step three. Is to answer some of these questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. That was your homework assignment. Looking at Matthew, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Mark chapter 5. Who, who wants to stand and read right quick for us? Real loud, loudly rather. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 7 for me. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Mark chapter 5. Then they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gadanians. That's good. And when he came, when he come out of the boat, immediately 
there met him out of the tomb a man that with, with an unclean spirit. Mm -hmm. Verse 3, who had his dwellings among the tomb, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often began bound with shekels and chain, and the chain had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, day, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tomb, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. Verse 7, And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I implore you, by God, that you do not torment me. Amen. Thank you. So when we look at this, what's, the first question is who? What's, what, what did you get for your answer? Who? Who? First of all, who's the author? Who's the writer? Okay, we know God is the author, okay? But who's the writer? Mark is the writer. John Mark is the writer, known here as St. Mark. He's the writer. The second question you ask yourself when you're doing your homework, who's involved in this text? Now tell me who's there. They, Jesus, and his disciples. Jesus is there. His group that came over with him. Who? Who else? Man. There's a man there. When you look at other um, gospel writers, they identify several men. Mark identifies one man. Who? Who else is there? At least one demon. At least one demon. Uh, many times you will find lesions, meaning several demons. Who is there? Who else is there? There's some other folk there. Who are those folk? Just read the text. When we read the text, who? So, Brown, you were about to tell me who. The people that had uh, tried to. The people. Him. It's in the text, right? The people who tried to chain him, tried to shackle him. Who else is there? Jesus is there, right? Jesus is there. His disciples are there, or whoever is following him. They are there. So, that's how you answer who. You got who the writer is. You have who's in the text. What is there? What is there? We already mentioned that there was at least one demon. So we would label that demon a what? What else is there? Who's talking? What is there? What is there? There's an unclean spirit there, right? What else is there? There's a boat there. Okay, they get off the boat. All these questions are being asked as we walk through this text. What else is there? Hmm? The tombs are there. The Bible says that this man had his dwelling, his living in the tomb. I call it a graveyard. What else is there? We said the demons. We said the tombs. How y'all missing it? Y'all missing this? How y'all missing it? Come on, just, oh, how y'all missing this? There are shackles there. There are chains there. That's good. There are stones there. He's cutting himself. He's cutting himself with stones. There are stones there. What about voices? There are voices there. Y'all see voices there? The Bible says in verse 5, he was crying out loud and he was, he, there are voices there. He's cutting himself. You see how you can't take any of this stuff for granted because it's all there? And when you have a real smart, smart student that's feeling his or herself that morning, they will ask you all kinds of questions. And it's your responsibility to pull them back to the text. So you have you have who, what, when. 
Some people will go back and they'll look at when the book of Mark is written, right? That's, that's when the text took place. But when, right off the bat it says, when they came off the boat. It took place when they came off the boat. There came a man who had his living in the tombs. And sometimes your answers will, will cross connect, which is where, where? In the tombs, in the graveyards, where? Galileans, the place of the Galileans, they're there. In Mark chapter five, these are just the first seven verses. And if you're going to teach the whole 20 verses, there's a lot of stuff to unpack. There's a lot of hermeneutics, hermeneutical studies you got to do. And then you're going to cross-reference it. How many of you have heard of synoptic gospel? The synoptic gospel. Anybody? Yes. What I heard a preacher just, he just tore it up. He tore it up so bad after the funeral, I wanted to go to him and say, Reverend, you got this exactly Baptist. <laughs> but I just left it alone. What are the synoptic gospels? What does that mean, synoptic? Similar. Similar? Similar. They, Same? Yeah, that they probably refer to a common source. A common. So when we look at the Gospels, you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic Gospels. In other words, they have the same story, some of the same stories in each one of them. And every time they tell a story, Brother Miles, they, they highlight different things. If we were to stand out on the front porch of this church and there's an accident right in front of the building, if there's 20 of us, we'll have 20 different explanations because our minds focus on, focus on different things. Our culture calls our attention to different things. Our history, our background calls our attention to different things. If a nurse would hear first thing she would or he would want to know, is the person hurt? If the person passes away, the first thing the preacher wants to know, was he saved? And if all of us are standing out there, we're going to tell the police officer 20 different things, but none of us will lie. It's just where your focus is. One writes to the Greek, one writes to the Hebrew, one, one writes to the, you know, medical terms. Luke used medical terms. So when you unpack all this hermeneutically, you're going to focus on different things. Yes? Have you ever heard somebody say, oh, he was driving, he had to be driving about 100 miles an hour. Some news reporters say he got up to 100 miles an hour speed. Well, that's true because the news reporter got her, his or her information from police officers. They measured him at 100 miles an hour. But that's not as important to most people as it is that he flipped over six times and now he's dead. It's all about the focus. So those synoptic gospels are who? Which ones? Synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So there's John. Why is John not a synoptic gospel? You know, he doesn't repeat the story. They talk, about the, they talk about how Jesus walked and what Jesus did. John cuts to the chase and said, Jesus came to give his life. Jesus came to save the unsaved. John just cuts straight to the chase. Whenever we have new converts, the first thing we ask them to do is read the book of John. Because John presents Jesus as the third person of a triune God right there in verse 1 right there in verses 1 through 13, right there at the beginning of chapter 1. John cuts straight through it. He doesn't mention all these things that the rest, rest of them mention. So the synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we covered where, why. What's the why in the text? Yes. There are three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is not considered one of them. So there are three synoptic gospels.
The next question we have here is where? I mean, why? We did where, right? Why? Why does man run up to Jesus? That's one of your questions. Why does man live in the tomb? We talked about uh, graveyard mentality last week. He was living in the tomb because he had graveyard mentality. Because he didn't think like other people think. Yes, sir. It's, it's, it's the demons that make him wrong. The legion. Okay, he was acting a fool because demons put, was in him. The legion, the legion runs to legion. runs to Jesus and tells what it was. Right, so the, the man is what we see, but the demons are speaking. Lord have mercy. The man. Now, it would have been okay for a snake to live in the graveyard. It would have been okay for a hog to live in the graveyard. But this is not a snake. This is not a dog. This is a man in the graveyard. Why is this man dwelling in the graveyard? Why? Because demons. He's demon-possessed. When a person is demon-possessed, they do what the demons command. Things are pretty bad for this brother. Mm -hmm. He cutting himself. The other thing is, why is this man breaking chains? Because he has supernatural powers. The devil is able to give supernatural powers. So, I mean, break it. Was God causing him to break the chain? If it's not of God, it's of the devil. So the demons was giving him supernatural powers. I mean, this stuff is real. It's real today. But it's not more powerful than the conquering king of Calvary, Jesus himself. God has supernatural powers that the devil can't stand. It says to us tonight that we need to make sure we stay with God. <laughs> Because the devil will lead us astray. The devil will make us hurt ourselves. Why was this man cutting himself? Because of the devil. People don't want to act like they act most of the time. It's, it's the devil. The satanic. I mean, the governor doesn't want to do what he does as a person. Now, that's one time the devil make him do it. The devil. I mean, it's... And when you're possessed, when you're overcome, people don't understand. Why did he do it? Because of the devil, demons. The last question is how. What did you find on how? How? How did he do it? When you look at verses one through five and first, when you look at verses one through five in Mark chapter five, this man is just flat out of control. Would you agree that he's out of control? Would you agree that he messed up? Would you agree that he can't control himself? Verses one through five, this man is out of control. But what happens in verse number six? There's a twist. There's a turn. There's an opposition. Look at verse number six. Someone read verse number six for me right quick. Right? Verse number six. Mark chapter five, verse number six. Someone hurry. Don't wait on anybody else. Let's do it. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped. When he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped. Verse number one, verses number one through five, this man is a mess. But the Bible says when he saw Jesus, woo, life came, became different. People, if we would just see Jesus. If your friend, your neighbor, your loved one would just see Jesus, their lives would be different. If they would just submit to the Bible said he saw Jesus, he ran to Jesus, and he worshiped Jesus. And when we get through verses all the way through verses one through twenty, you'll find out that the folk in the town was surprised 
And then some of them were mad. And then we ask the question, why? Why were they mad? Because Jesus just messed up their income. That says something to us. When you're doing badly, people will use your bad acting, will use your bad condition to make money off of you. People have already said the state doesn't want to clean up the psychological issues because they make money off of it. Every time somebody does something, they say it's a mental issue. <laughs> they are not fit to stand trial. Mm -hmm. But that person's loved one, the other person's loved one is gone. My question becomes, if they're not fit to stand trial, what are they fit for? Yeah, I admit, I admit that there are some people, many people who struggle with mental illness. And we, we probably would never understand it until Jesus gets back. But the government ought not make profits and ought not let people go free every single time. How did he do it? He did it because he had extra, extraordinary power. Have you ever seen people on drugs and, and you can tase them and they keep coming? You can shoot them and they keep coming? You can shoot them several times and the adrenaline is flowing and they keep coming? It's time for the police officer to run. Get out of there. The devil has a way of threatening the very peace of mankind. But when you get to verse number six, thank God for verse six. When you get to verse number six, it says, when he saw Jesus, he ran to Jesus. He worshiped Jesus. It says to us today that when Jesus is on the scene, power is transferred to that condition through Jesus, and Jesus has the power. If Jesus can't fix it, it can't be fixed. The disciples will tell you, we were on a boat in Mark chapter 4. They were on a boat. The, the winds and the waves got it all out of control. Jesus stands up and said, peace be still. And the, the nature that they were threatened by laid down and slept like a baby. I mean, the, the waves were up. Theologians say the waves were 15 to 20 feet tall coming into the boat. Jesus stood up on the boat and said, peace be still. And 15, 20 foot waves just laid down and became calm. The wind was howling and Jesus said, peace be still. The wind just hushed. It didn't take long. Isn't that something? We serve the almighty God himself. He can do it. He can fix it. The Bible said the same man that was running crazy. Why do you say crazy? Do you agree that he's crazy? Do you agree that he really has a mental illness? Do you agree that something wrong with this man? He's in the graveyard. Some of you all told me last week you don't even want to live in a house next to the graveyard. Don't be concerned about the dead folk. It's the living folk that you got to be concerned about. Why you don't want to live next to the graveyard? Anybody? I mean, that was a thing back in, in the day. You know, you, you walk through the graveyard and use that path to get home. That's what your partners bothered you with. And they, they hid in the bushes and, and scared you. Anybody just can't stand living in the graveyard or living next to the graveyard? Anybody? Okay, raise your hand if you want to build your, your mansion next to the graveyard. <laughs> Why not? Yes, sir. It's not my first choice, but if I get a free house next to the graveyard, I'll <laughs> <laughs> He said it's not his best choice, his first choice, his favorite choice, but if he gets a free house, he'll move right in. <laughs> <laughs> Sophia. 
You gonna move in with him? <laughs> she already said she sold it. She would sell it. <laughs> that sell that house. Oh my goodness. We are scared of dead folk. What about the people just walking around? So Sister Derrick said she'll have it, she'll take it. Give her that mansion next to the graveyard. So we have to understand that in order to really, really unpack the word, we have to ask these questions. Your homework assignment should have gone like this. I'm sure it did. I won't, won't take up the papers today, but you need to do it. This is what your, the question should have been. Who is the writer here? To whom is he writing? Where are the verbs? Where are the nouns? When you look at a sentence, as you would look at a passage, you want to know where are the verbs, where are the nouns? Because you have to remember that words are vehicles by which thoughts are conveyed. Words. You know why people get so confused with text messages? Because words can be so misconstrued. I would much rather you call me and have a conversation. I mean, let's just, let's just have a conversation. I mean, there are some things you can text and, and, and it'll be right there for you. You can, you can handle it. But conversation, you get a chance to dialogue and say, this is what I think you mean. And men, when you're talking to women, you got to make sure. You better make very sure that the communication is on time. That the communication is right. And sometimes the communication is as much as nonverbal as it is verbal. I know, I know, and I'll call you. <clears throat> what does that mean? <clears throat> I don't trust you. I don't believe you. <clears throat> yeah, right. <laughs> you see my point? And then, if you don't even grunt, it means something. But you can see two people walk past each other like they don't even just say something. It's communication. So, you need to look for the verbs. You need to look for the tense of the verb. What do I mean say verb tense? What do I mean? And look for the verb tense. It says that the man saw him. Yes. Past tense. The man have, has seen him. Has seen him. You can't say has saw. You got to say has seen. Right? You can't say I seen him even, even though people say it every day. I, mean, I seen him. I have seen him. This past tense, right? So it means something happened. So you need to look for the nouns, the verbs. You need to see what subjects are talking to each other and what object is there. We're just going back to fifth grade English. How do these things take place? How many sentences are there? Where are the prepositions? What are the prepositions saying to us? Let me give you this. Biblical hermeneutics have structure. Biblical hermeneutics has structure. There are five things that we're looking at when we're preparing. And for people who write all their stuff out, you certainly need to know this. The first one is called exodium. Exodium. E-X-O-R-D-I-U-M. Exodium. E-X-O-R-D-I-U-M. The exodium. The word exodium means that which is said first. It is that which is said first. Teacher gets up to, to teach. He's, he, he's speaking or she's speaking and it's whatever he or she says first. It's, it goes like this, it's 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. It goes kind of like this. Okay, it's 9 o'clock. <laughs> okay, it's Bible study time. Okay, it's Sunday school time. Doing worship service at 1030, it kind of goes like this. 
Good morning, New Beginning Church and all our online families and friends. That is the exodium. For some preachers, their exodium is a prayer. They get up, they're introduced, they approach, and they say, Lord, I thank you. They say that before they even talk to the audience. That is the exodium. That which is said first. And many times the exodium is the attention giver. Or attention getter, rather. The attention. I'm getting your attention. I've seen a guy stand up at a banquet, people just talking and, and making noise. And, and a woman got up and she said, okay, everybody take their seat. People just still talking and making noise. And the exodium became nonverbal. Preacher got up, he stood up at the mic. And you just start staring at the folk that were standing up. Didn't say anything. Just start staring. At they were walking. He watched them walk and watched. Them, let everybody see him walk. Wherever his eyes were, people started turning around at the table. And guess what happened? There was a hush. Oh no! So the exodium is the attention giver. Get her. Number two, the introduction. Introduction. In fifth grade English, we learned that the introduction does one thing. It tells the people what we're going to say. The introduction gets up and I say, I'm looking at Mark chapter 5, verses number 1 through one through 5, and we're going to talk about these three points. That's what I say in my introduction. I'm going to talk about good news. I'm going to talk about the graveyard. I'm going to talk about Jesus. That's my introduction. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about in my introduction. So in the introduction, you tell them what you're going to talk about. Then in your body, you come back and you tell them what you're talking about. You tell them what you told them you're going to talk about, and then you talk about it. So in the body, I'm going to talk about what three things I told you I'm going to talk about, I'm talking about it. So I'm going to actually talk about what I said I was going to talk about. This is fifth grade English, right? Then there's a conclusion. What do you think the conclusion does? The conclusion restates what I just talked about. The conclusion restates. I told you in my introduction, I'm going to talk about A, B, and C. In my body, I talked about A, B, and C. And in my conclusion, I rehearsed what I just talked about. That's why some preachers stand up and say, I'm closing now, but they've been closing three times. <laughs> they'll say, I'm closing now, and then they'll tell you those three things or those five things they talk about, again, in the conclusion. So you rehearse or restate. And the last one is memory. Memory. Now, the memory is not just memory. The memory In the memory, you're going to tell them how it applies to you. You talk about how Jesus has blessed this man in the graveyard, and now I'm going to tell you, not only did he bless the man in the graveyard, he's also blessed me. And you're going to talk about when God blessed you or when you know that God blessed somebody else. That's the memory. You're recalling to memory, and it applies to what you just said. So I want to get to this big idea before, before we close and then the, the supporting ideas. When you're looking for a subject, I said last week you're looking for a subject and this subject ought to be found in the scripture, right? You shouldn't just dream up something. Read the word. I read the word. I'm talking about a man in the graveyard, Jesus healing him, Jesus taking over his body. And now I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to ask I ask two questions in order to get my big idea. And the big idea is the same thing as the subject, okay? What is the text? What, what do I mean when I say text? I don't mean on your phone. When I say the text says, what am I talking about? The passage of scripture. The text, the passage, the, it's the same thing as the pericope. What's a pericope? Complete, one complete thought. Okay, so when I look at the scripture, I, I ask myself, Two questions in order to get the big idea or the subject. I ask the first question, what is the author talking about? What is the author talking about? 
What is the author talking about? Then my second question is, who is the author talking about? Then I get my big idea. Those two questions give me the big idea. What is the author talking about and who is the author talking about? So tell me in this passage, verses 1 through 7, what is the author talking about? Just ask yourself, what is the author talking about? And I know this is ending a question with a preposition. I'm good with that, okay? I know all of them going to end with preposition. I know that's, that's defeating my training of English. I should not be ending in preposition. So what is the author talking about? What do you see? Everybody here may see something different. Okay, I'm going to go around the room. Sister Davis, what is the author talking about? Uh, the man with the unclean spirit. The man with the unclean spirit. Uh, Brother Galvan, what is the author talking about? Yeah, well, the spirits, the demons lead uh, coming to the demon living in the man. Living in the man. Okay. So, Sister Gavin, what are you talking about? Um, the demons coming to the demons that are attacking the man. Yes. Sophia, what is the author talking about? I'm looking for a big idea. What is he talking about? Everybody's right because everybody see what they see. The man worshiping Jesus? Okay. Okay. Sister, Sister Woods, what is the author talking about? Unclean spirit. Man with unclean spirit. Sister Brown, what is the author talking about? Man going to Jesus for help. Man going to Jesus for help. Brother Miles, what is the author talking about? Man with the unclean spirit worshiping Jesus. Man with the unclean spirit worshiping Jesus. So, now when I, if I get up on Sunday, remember the big idea is my subject, right? And if I get up on Sunday and I say, the man with the unclean spirit worshiping Jesus, what y'all going to say? Ooh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Brother Whitlock, Sister Whitlock, what, what is the author talking about? A demon possessed man. A demon possessed man. Sister Whitlock. Jesus can change any situation. Jesus can change any situation. I thought she was going to hoop on that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, <let you> do. <laughs> <laughs> I can't sing, so I can't hoop. <laughs> sister, sister Darrington, what is the author talking about? Uh, he's talking about legions. Legions. Many demons. Okay, look at this. This is what I came up with. Y'all tell me if I'm crazy or not. Well, you may know that, but just tell me if I'm crazy concerning this. Okay, Mark chapter 10, I mean Mark chapter 5, rather, verses 1 through 7. My big idea, the first one was graveyard mentality. Where did I get that from? This man got graveyard mentality. He think like people that just headed to death. He he has no, he's living in the graveyard, so he, he created a mindset of graveyard mentality. My next one was uh, Jesus' power over demons. Jesus' power over demons. My next one was Jesus delivers a man from the tomb. My brother Miles said, well, you, you, uh, that's long. Jesus delivers a man from the tomb. And this is the one that I preach consistently. The final one is good news from the graveyard. Why did I, get, why did I say good news from the graveyard? Because the man was in a bad way. When Jesus showed up, he ran and, and worshipped him. And as we go forward, we're going to find out not only did he worship him, he became an evangelist for Jesus. Y'all read that whole passage when you get home, okay? He became evangelism for Jesus, so this man had good news from the graveyard. I see some preachers watching me. They're they going to preach that one. <laughs> good news from the graveyard. Man, a, Jesus delivers a man from the tomb. Graveyard mentality. Jesus' power over demons. Jesus can change anything. Jesus can do anything. Jesus' life, Jesus can make your life different. Okay, that's the big idea. All that goes into the big idea. Then we look at the supporting ideas. What does supporting mean? It's not the table, but it's the legs to the table. It holds it up, right? The supporting ideas, you got to ask three questions to get the supporting ideas. Number one, what is the author saying about the subject? 
We've come to the conclusion that the subject is graveyard mentality. What is the, what is the author saying about graveyard mentality? What is the author saying about Jesus changing everything? What is the author saying about good news? So you have your first point is what is the author saying about the subject? The next point is what are the impacts in the text? What are the impacts? What do you see in Mark chapter 5? What are the impacts in Mark chapter 5? When Jesus shows up, this man comes down. When Jesus shows up, when you get down to verses 7 through, through 20, you'll find out that the town folk came out in Mark chapter 5. The town people came out and they found this man clothed and in his right mind. Now, Big Mama and them used to say, thank God because I'm clothed in my right mind. But when you look at the text, the man is naked. And the Bible says after he met Jesus, he put on some clothes. And therefore, the people came out and they saw him clothed and in his right mind. And let me tell you, there's nothing with being clothed in your right mind. But the text is, declares that they found this man the same people that saw him, the same people that saw him running crazy, the same people that saw him acting a fool, the same people that saw him cut himself, the same people that tried to shackle him, and he would not get be shackled because he broke the shackles and the chain. Those same people come out and say, look at here, he's clothed and in his right mind. He ain't running around in the graveyard naked anymore. He is clothed and in his right mind. So Sir Henry said, I preached that on August 17, 2005. <laughs> Good news from the graveyard. So, <laughs> what is the author saying about the subject? The next question is, what are the impacts of the text? This man was delivered. This man was set free from demons. This man calmed down. Only if our police officers would read this and see how to de-escalate. If they would pray, they could de-escalate. And the final question on the supporting ideas is, what are the impacts in my life? You're reading this. How does this apply to your life? All the way from verses 1 through 20, Mark chapter 5, there are plethoras of information, of things applying to your life. The question always is, how does this apply to my life? That's where you get your conclusion in your memory. How does it apply to my life? You don't live in the graveyard, but you do have graveyard mentality. Even if you haven't had it lately, you've had it at one time. How does this apply to my life? And then we get our supporting ideas of these questions. You have a big idea, which is our subject, and we want to ask ourselves, what is the author talking about? Who is the author talking about? And then for our supporting ideas, we want to ask the questions, what is the author saying about what he's talking about? Or what is the author saying about the subject? How does in, this impact, what impact is made in the text? And then finally, what are the impacts in my life? The Bible is real. The Bible ought to show your life and show you where your life is. This is real stuff. The Bible wants to show you who you are so you can be made to differ. And guess what the pivoting verse is? Anybody know? The pivoting verse is verse number six. The Bible said when he saw Jesus, he changed his mind. He changed his way. And that's why we introduce people to Christ so that they can change their ways. There may be somebody that needs their ways changed tonight. You get to know Jesus. You need to get to know Jesus for who you are, where you are, and what you're doing. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You need to get to know Jesus. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal savior, this is your moment. This is your opportunity to get to know him. 
just believe the story as found in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. John chapter 3 verses 16 and 17. They all say, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, they all say, believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. If you can believe that story today, you can be born again. You can be saved right here, right now, regardless of where you are. Just bow your heads with me and, and ask Jesus to come into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe that you're born again if you honestly prayed this prayer, giving your life to Christ. We believe that you're saved and you're on your way to heaven. Well, we thank God for who he is and what he's already done. We thank God for, for blessing us one more time. It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering and sacrificial gifts. It is offering time. For those of you who are giving electronically, you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Zelle is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com If you want to mail in your offering, you can do so by mailing it to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459 That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459 Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Thank you for for worshiping with us for Bible study tonight. Please feel free to log in and visit us at 4251 Shuramai Road, Houston, Texas. That's 4251 Shuramai, spell S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R, Shuramai Road, Houston, Texas, 77048. That's 4251 Shuramai Road. Houston, Texas, 77048. Please join us for 9 o'clock Sunday school on Sunday morning. Please join us for 1030 on Sunday morning for our worship service. And again, join us as you did tonight for 715 for our Bible study. Thank you so much for being here. Father God, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you, Father, for all that you do. We thank you for money. We thank you for income. We thank you for increase. We thank you, Father God, for trusting us with your resources. Now we come to give back to you. In the name of Jesus, amen and thank God. Let us stand to be dismissed. Please remember those on our prayer list. Please continue to lift up those on our prayer list. Thank you again for praying for Megan. Uh, she's back at work and she's doing fine. And God has tremendously blessed. And we are looking forward to God doing great and, and mighty things. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for those, Father God, who are on our prayer list. We ask you to bless every person. We pray for the Dixon family even right now. We ask you to bless them and keep them. Comfort them even in times like these. We ask you, Father God, to walk with them. And bless them to know that you are still God. Lord, we pray for every sick, every bereaved person. Yes. We pray, Father God, that you continue to keep us. This is our prayer. We pray, Father God, for Sister Patty. We ask you to bless her life and heal her body. Lord, we pray continually, Father God, for our sick, our shut-in. We pray for our elderly and our young people. We ask you to protect our young people as they migrate out of school into this summer period. We ask you to walk with them and keep them. Keep their mind away from graveyard mentality. Bless them, Father God, to follow you and be delivered by you. 
Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen, amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you and God keep you.